now i'd like to request dr shrinivas desai sir to present on coronary vascular anatomy and their variations but uh, sets it up let, at the outset let me extend my sincere thanks to my colleagues from uh, aurangabad dr kondekar his entire team and congratulate you for starting this new chapter uh, very good super more important the topic the theme which they have selected is something out of the world and honestly in my last 40 year career the first time i am giving lectures on anatomy only the conference which is based on anatomy it's really really creditable after listening to priyanka's talk i really thank god that i am senior because at this if they were in competition and i was younger i wouldn't have survived at all so so very very good talk priyanka you know lovely good pictures and rajesh superb talk i have great respect for ultrasonologists you know they are like the people who go on chandrayaan and mars and and then study all those things i it just i i can't make out what exactly is going on so trust me that is superb absolutely superb lovely having said that we'll try and i'll restrict myself to just the anatomy which is a, actually it's a good concept to try and understand the radiological anatomy of different structures because unless uh um, you are a good anatomist and a good pathologist you cannot become a good radiologist but that's that's the bottom line you have to know the pathology well and you have to know your anatomy well to understand what is going wrong to diagnose which is a, away from the anatomy either is variation or the pathological change and then make your diagnosis the level of confidence goes up appreciably so when you look at the technological advances what has happened it has moved from small one slice to 250 6 500 to thousands now we're talking about the volume scan and we are talking about the time i remember when i started doing now it will look like a vestiges when i started doing the ct scan in 1983 and now we are talking about now uh, in those days the one slice around the head would take almost almost a 30 40 seconds or um, or you can say even minute today you do one organ in one second so that much is the speed with which the technological advances has gone and we has gone from single source to dual source the so, uh, and so what has happened the scan time has come down the motion artifacts have come come down and what has gone up is the higher resolution the sensitivity the specificity and the everything else has gone on in a big way that's the big difference which is making so what is the new thing which is happening in ct norm again speed contrast and spatial resolution please remember that that's what it is and now uh, very near future you will start seeing something new in ct which is called as photon counting ct that is another big revolution coming in ct instead of the x ray counting it will be the photon counting ct which will make a big difference in our the way we will be looking at the city pictures and we'll appreciate the city pictures so what's uh, for, for to do any angio or any anything because this is an angiogram so there has to be obviously preparation so the patient has to have a normal creatinine level so fasting for 4 hours so he doesn't puke uh, he can have some sips of water no problem and he can continue all his medications whatever he is on because most of these guys are on the statin on the antihypertensives and all those things what is the pre medication if patient's heart rate is good and everything is nice you may not need a pre medication but trust me it's safer to do the pre medication because if you have a heart rate around 70 or less the picture quality is amazing and then your positive predictive value and negative predictive value both are extremely high a uh, standard it, everybody using is different different some people use the beta lock 50 to 100 some people use evabradin 5 mg and uh, we use standard is evabradin 5 mg uh, 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 some one there are two three ways we give 5 mg on a previous night after the dinner at bed time and 5 mg 2 hour before the study or you can use six uh, just one evabradin 6 mg 5 uh, mg 6 hours before the study but by and large to all our patients we give 0.25 restil people might laugh it but trust me it works magic it works magic and you get the excellent quality pictures without any problem i have still remember one of our parsi gentleman neurologist who is they are supposed to have a very normal uh, coronaries because they live longer and he always used to boast i'm perfectly okay and i don't want to do it and all that but as like all, all normal human being 
they also have the problem so he comes i call this as after eight phenomena in just look was we have done the ct coronary angios of almost every single ct uh, consultant in just look but they invariably came after eight o'clock in the night but they didn't want to be seen by someone else that he is going for a coronary simple it's a bad bad aspect of the bombay practice so uh, he came and uh, he was bragging as usual and i told him take pretty still he said now uh, i never don't need it and then he lie down on the table and when we saw his heart rate 120 130 140 so that happens that invariably happens though uh, so it's a normal human thing is it works better that's what it is so no matter what time the scanner or data acquisition is used it's prudent to lower the heart rate to less than 65 beats or 70 what it is to obtain a good quality picture with dual source dual energy many times we don't do it but still because i have both the single source dual energy and dual source dual energy i'm being lucky but we can do that so what is the uh, uh, standard three step you have topograph normal then do the calcium scoring in every individual and then do the coronary ct angiogram so this is how the ch like a chest x ray you the topogram just try and find out anything obviously wrong and uh, calcium score you don't need contrast for calcium score it will detect and quantify the coronary artery calcification and you it's usually generated using the software you don't have to use your brain for that especially when the first the calcium score came into the picture before standard coronary angio came it was made up of a big 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 issue across the world even there was a machine installed in dubai where all the people from india used to go to get their calcium score done and thinking and depending on calcium score will judge that yes i have got a heart disease or not over the years we have understood that this is not that important but there are certain criteria on which we can look at the calcium score this how the calcium score pictures will look like sorry and uh, you try and see whether there is any calcium along the course of the coronary arteries and then it automatically um, calculates so what is the importance the patients who have calcium are more likely to have non calcified plaque and that's far more important the calcified plaque is never a worry because does not rupture the non calcified plaque or the lipid plaque are the ones which have a tendency to rupture all those things which you see in the movie ma is all the rupture of the calcium plaque patient dies that's what that's what it is okay so that's because the plaque ruptures goes distally and this uh, blocks the distal artery and that's all that's therefore knowing a plaque load is far more important than knowing the narrowing and that's one of the biggest advantage of ct coronary uh, the regular angiograms the uh, intervene the inter, uh, the catheter angiogram cannot detect the plaque load uh, it it's it's a predictor of the coronary event and myocardial infarct although a positive score is specific marker for the presence of the coronary artery disease it is not specific for the obstructive coronary artery disease here i'll tell you data the people who had the high calcium score and when they underwent the uh, the standard catheter angiogram 90% of them and even those who had a myocardial infarct 82% of them did not have an obstructive occlusive coronary artery disease so it's a one time event it happens due to the plaque rupture it has a high negative predictive value of 86 to 90% and if you look at the bottom line see normally uh, looking at the calcium score you can say the risk interpretation could be uh, from very low to the high level what you need to do is depending on that there's a the mod modification of the lifestyle and all those things and taking statin statin is a wonder drug everybody should take it ct volume data set of the coronary artery is acquired with a contrast you inject contrast it will it will cover the entire heart from the proximal ascending aorta which is approximately 1 to 2 cm below the carina to the diaphragmatic surface of the heart and it's usually acquired in single breath hold and this other once you get the good pictures it will look like beautifully you will identify all the arteries i'll show you every single artery separate separate and their anatomy this is the angiographic view with the contrast going into the artery and today the positive negative predictive value of coronary artery is 99 to 100% while positive predictive value of well done coronary angiogram is between 92 to 96% so you have a phenomenal tool in your hand which can predict and kind of warn the cardiologist whether he, he should intervene or not intervene and you could be a cardio radiologist to a patient you can run your own opd that way you can do what is called as a curved mpr so that uh, to show all the arteries and their branches to their detail or you can do what is called as the vr volume rendered image to show them in more detail so that, those are the different tools which are in our hand to do show them and 3d vr images that's pretty because they have background of the heart this is the image which you should show 
to the patient who has undergone a coronary angio because this comes immediately on your console. So they are all anxious. You just bring them out and show them. Then you evaluate it later. But then this looks very, very pretty. This is one which is very, very useful. You should do what is called as long axis MPR. So you straighten up the artery, which is very important. And when you straighten up the artery, it becomes a lot easier for us to appreciate whether there is any narrowing. And it, it, narrowing is one aspect, whether it's significant narrowing or in, along the course of any artery, whether it is a LAD or CERC or RCA, we are looking at. Now, what is the de definition of a significance? When the mm, caliber is reduced by more than 50% in left main, it is significant. Rest of the coronary arteries, that is CERC, the LAD, RCA, it has to be more than 70%. So 50% narrowing in LAD or CERC or 55% in CERC is not significant and does not demand any intervention whatsoever. So when you look at this, in the, the, along the curved MPR, this is the long axis MPR and you take pictures, you can see normal caliber, narrowed caliber, normal caliber. So you know which area is narrowed and how much it is narrowed, you can just put the marker and measure the diameter and you can say this much percentage is very very easy okay now look at this uh, sinus this is sinus of salva so the right sinus of salva which is here is the anterior the left sinus of salva is here which is posterior so our RC arises from right sinus and the left main arises from the left sinus and that is the non coronary sinus so there are three parts that's all it will look like in axial and normally, the LED <coughs> uh, left comes at a higher level than the uh, RCA. RCA and LCA both arise the, with, from their respective uh, sinus of valsalvas, as I already showed you. The LCA arises at a level that is cephalad, that is cranial, to the RCA. So please remember that when you are looking at the axials, first you will see the left and then you will see the right. The ra origin of the right coronary from the right coronary sinus and left main coronary from the left coronary sinus. That's the standard. That's what the normal. And you've got to get used to looking at the normal. And so this is, then you play around. This is basically, these are the pictures to impress the patients. Let me tell you that. What is really good is what I just showed you. That is much more important from, for us to be more diagnostic. Now let's look at the course of the RCA. It courses anteriorly and laterally from the ostium at the right sinus of Valsalva. And where does it go? It goes into right atrioventricular groove along the, between the groove between the atria and ventricle, curves posteriorly at the acute margin of the right ventricle. It bifurcates into the posterior descending artery, that is PDA, commonly known as PDA, and posterior lateral LB branch. There are two branches which will come. I'll show you all the branches. And RCA supplies the free wall of the right ventricle. So RCA is responsible for right ventricle. What are the RCA branches? The first branch is a conus branch, which arises in uh, most of the times from the 50% uh, of the times from the RCA, but rest 50 it comes directly from the aortic root. So you might see another branch coming from the aortic root next to RCA, that is conus branch of RCA. <coughs> Remember that. Then there are the sinoatrial branches. These are they arise from the RCA in most of the patients, that is 60%. And directly from and from the circ, that is circumflex artery, in 40%. Acute margin is the next branch, atrioventricular, nodal PDA, and postoventricular. These are the, all the branches which we studied in first year of anatomy. We are revisiting them now in your course. How many of you are students? Just raise hands. So rest everybody is all already well informed people sitting here. Okay. All right. So this is how the RCA looks like. That's the course of the RCA. That's a conus branch. That's the acute marginal branch. And that's the posterior descending. That's a PDA. So proximal portion extends from the origin of to, uh, uh, to the acute marginal branch. What is the mid portion? Because we are describing this in the report. Proximal I F RCA, mid RCA, the distal. So we have to know what we are talking about. The proximal is from the origin to acute marginal. Mid is from the acute marginal to the horizontal portion of the posterior or right atrioventricular groove and distal is extending beyond that. I'll show you how does it look like. This is how it looks like. So that's the proximal, that's the middle, and that's the distal RCA. 
okay proximal is the second marginal branch so this is middle where it is became horizontal and this is distal now comes the left main coronary it divides into two main branches the left anterior descending that is lad and left circumflex artery occasionally it will trifurcate and you will get one more branch between these two and that is ramus intermedius how does the lad go it courses in the anterior interventricular it is not atrioventricular it goes in the interventricular groove to the apex of the heart so between two ventricles the lad will go down lad is also called as the artery of the widow lad is very very important artery if it gets blocked the chances of the constant instant death are very very high so that, that that's how the lad will look like thanks and i'll show you more details so this is how lad looks what are the branches this called septal perforators you can see them coming from uh, up medial side and diagonals which are coming from the lateral side so septal perforators they run perpendicular to the lad and supply the anterior two thirds of the septum so basically they supply the septum while the diagonals they could be from 1 to number 6 and they are numbered as d1 d2 d3 aisa jitna tumko dikhega utna and they on, run on the epicardial surface of the heart and supply the anterolateral portion of the left ventricle so they are they are supplying the lv and therefore they are very very important lad is again divided into proximal mid and distal proximal origin to the first diagonal mid from the first to second diagonal and distal distal to the second diagonal important because from the treatment point of view so this is how proximal this is lad you can see that so that's a proximal lad where d1 comes out that's a mid lad where d2 comes out and then is the third is the distal lad what is type 1 lad which does not reach up to the apex of the heart what is type 3 lad which goes up to the apex of the heart curves around and and goes back so type 1 type 2 and type 3 are the three types of the lad these are more for a descriptive purpose they don't have a great clinical significance per se circ it runs along the left atrioventricular this is not interventricular it goes to the atrioventricular groove in 80 25% it dom it terminates into the obtuso marginal branch and that is called as right dominance while it might give rise to the pda pda normally comes on the rca and the left posterior parietal branch that time you describe that is a left dominance important to know from the treatment point of view so this is how the circ will look like circs give rise to om arteries numbered sequentially as they arise 1 2 3 and all that and it is again divided into proximal and distal portion related to the major om branch how do you divide that the om1 and om2 you can see it that's that's the circ which is going down that's the om1 and that's the om2 so this is where and this will be proximal and this will be the distal then it keeps on dividing into om1 om2 om3 so this is an example of the right dominance when right ic goes and becomes a pda left dominance where the circ will become a pda ramus is between the two branches between the the lad and the circ the circ comes the prominent artery and goes and divides it's a ramus intermedius so there are multiple segments of the artery now this is little little boring but it's easy to understand it's nothing great if you look at that 1 2 3 4 is all along the rca the 5 6 7 8 all along the segments of the left main and the lad then the 9 10 are along the the diagonals then 11 12 13 are along the circ and the rest of things are from the om and then the posterior lateral branch in pds they give number 15 and 16 you have to remember this why when you describe in your report if you want to be specific you want to be more impressive you can say this particular branch and this segment is occluded it can it can give a good amount of uh, impression to your referring cardiologist not referring clinician this i have been saying for last 35 years people are bored of me saying this but i don't leave it because we are clinicians radiology is a clinical branch please don't forget this if you visit the who classification of the medicine you will find radiology under clinical branch so you are and you should be a clinician you should examine patient you should go to the ward you should do all those things because you are the only person who knows every single branch 
rest of them know only their branches. You are expected to and you are knowing every single branch. So you are far better. So don't refer anybody else as a clinician. So these are the different uh, segments which you should describe when you do the reporting. So the having seen the normal, we'll see what are the normal anomalies we will come across when you are seeing it and whether they are significant, whether they should, we should uh, report them and we should whether warn them. Morning, sir. Uh, uh, coronary artery anomalies of the origin, heart takeoff, uh, uh, multiple ostia, single coronary artery, anomalous origin of right coronary artery from pulmonary artery, origin of coronary artery or branch from opposite or non-coronary. You, uh, you can read the list. I need not read the list. Just see this carefully. You can put it on your um, uh, console table and try to see any one of this is there in the angiogram which you are looking at. So what are the most important things? The anomalies of the origins are important for us. Course of the anomalous artery is very, very important for us. And myocardial bridging to a certain extent is important to us. They can also be classified as hemodynamically significant or insignificant. <coughs> hemodynamically significant coronary artery anomalies are malignant and not significant are benign. So that we need to know. So hemodynamically significant, what are those anomalies? Anomalous origin of either the left coronary or the right coronary from the pulmonary artery. Bad. It's a hemodynamically significant. To look whether it is coming from that, either of them pulmonary. An anomalous course between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. This is very important. That, that is called as interarterial. Though the artery runs between the root of the aorta and the pulmonary artery of either the, it could be the RCA arising from the left sinus of Pulsalva or the LCA arising from the right sinus of Pulsalva. Anything of this happens and it has an interarterial course, it's malignant. Occasional myocardial bridging and congenital coronary artery fistula, fistulous communication between one of the coronary arteries and, and the adjacent mediastinal vessels. So, the commonest is coronary artery arising from the opposite or non-coronary sinus. That depending on the anatomic relationship, of this anomalous vessel to the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, they are divided into four different categories. Interarterial means between two arteries, that is between the aorta and pulmonary artery. So it's the artery courses through these two, pulmonary artery and aorta. Retroaortic, obviously behind the aorta. Prepulmonic, in front of the pulmonary artery. And septal, that is up below the pulmonary artery. So these are the four categories of the anomalous cores. So this is how it look like. It's very easy. See, that's an RCA. You see this coursing between the aortic valve and pulmonary valve. Bad. <coughs> this is a malignant variety. Here, it goes behind. As you can see, it goes behind the aorta, retroaortic. Here, it goes in front of the pulmonary artery. It's a prepulmonic. And here, it goes below the pulmonary artery. It is subpulmonic. So these are the four types. As you can see here, this RCA is arising and coursing through between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. You can keep on seeing it. Going, going, here it goes, then it comes out and it goes. So it's basically going through between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. It's the same one. It's a malignant RCA because it's an interarterial course. It's not accepted. It can get compressed due to the pulsations and the same malignant RCA which we showed, uh, which I showed you on the volume rendered image to make the image look better. So this is, this is how it is. Uh, if this is uh, RCA and this is the pulmonary artery. This is uh, anomalous origin of the left circumflex from the right sinus. Can you appreciate that? that it is coming, it's directly coming from the left sinus, the right sinus. The, so right coronary and left circumflex artery are originating from the same origin, that's an anomalous origin. Here it's a single coronary artery arising from the right coronicus. You can see that. So it's a single and then divides into RCA and left main. <coughs> this is not that bad, but when, it, uh, when uh, they do the cath angio, they don't find, they don't find the left a lot at all because it's coming from this. So that they can get into the problem and come back to you and ask, ask you about this. Now this is an important thing. You can see a fistulous vessel, that a fistulous vessel is going between the left anterior descending 
and main pulmonary artery. So there is a communication between the pulmonary artery and the LAD. And here, there is a direct origin of the conus branch from the aorta instead of the RCA. This is another important thing. Anomalous origin of left coronary artery from the pulmonary trunk. You can see it here. It's coming, the left ACA is coming directly from the pulmonary artery. So these are the normal variations which you should know. And then lastly, before I end my talk, I'll touch base on what is called as a myocardial bridging. The coronary arteries normally run on the surface of the, uh, of the heart. They, they do, when it tunnels through the myocardium, that means dips below the myocardium, it is called as myocardial bridging. So systolic compression of the myocardial bridging is found to correlate better with the depth than the length. So it's not the length of the myocardial bridging which is important. Depth, from what depth, from the, the, the what, how, much, how much deep the artery dips inside the myocardium is more important in terms of defining it as bad or good. So which they are usually divided into type 1, type 2, type 3 or grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 up to 1 to 2 millimeter, 2 to 5, 5 millimeter and more than 5 millimeter. If it's more than 5 millimeter deep to the myocardium, it is usually more susceptible to get compressed during the systole and that can cause a sudden death or a sudden myocardial infarct. So seeing the myocardial bridging and reporting it is important. You got to see it, it dips inside and goes inside but here it is going only by two millimeter so it's not that important but please trace the course of the arteries on your table and see whether anywhere it is dipping inside and that will thank thank you very much for your kind attention yes that's i told you no? it depends on the type grade one two and three when it is one to two millimeter deep to the myocardium, it is not significant. Up to five millimeter also, it does not get malignantly compressed. But if the depth is more than five millimeter, then the chances of it getting compressed during systole, because myocardium contracts and getting temporarily completely obstructed is very high. And therefore, you need to correct it surgically. Welcome. Dr. Desai sir, sir needs no introduction as you know. He is a legendary figure in the radiology who is a pioneer behind the education uh, uh, activities. Uh, he popularizes the cross-sectional Im imaging. He is a pioneer in that, Dr. Kohli sir and he and that too in Goa sir. So <laughs> we are looking for your next uh, academic activity. As you ask uh, how many students are there? Sir, we are, are, are where your students are your students and will remain your students. We, thank, though thank we you. grow old <laughs> listening to you, but still you are young as you were before. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening Hello, lecture. Dr. Srinivas, just, just one question. You know, many people, I mean, many people, many patients, even doctors, you know, those who are. Uh, practicing, they ask, what do you feel? Should we go for the coronary NGO, CT NGO, or a real gold standard, uh, what we call is a angiography? Yeah, this is a standard question. There is nothing happening. Uh, basically, what happens, uh, there is always a question of uh, more than academic, non-academic interest. You know that. That's going to happen. But we'll just stick to the literature which has been published. What is important when anything new gold standard comes is looking at what is the non-NPP and the PPP, the negative predictive value and the positive predictive value. In PPP, if you do the coronary if it's normal, what is the percentage that it will turn out to be normal if you do a cath angio? So today, the coronary has reached the stage in terms of the resolution, in terms of the quickness and everything of NPP being almost 100%. And PPP, positive predictive value, when I say it is 55%, it turning out to be 55% on the invasive coronary angio or it turning out to be more than that or less than that. All those things are the called as PPP. And today PPP is between 92 to 96 percent. So obvious answer is obvious. Now when you talk about the risk factors of the heart disease, amongst one of the risk factors of the heart disease, there are six risk, risk factors. And one of the risk factors is male aged 50 is a risk factor. And women around 50 on pills is another risk factor. So those are the 
the risk factor which are not related to rest of the things then hypertriglyceridemia and all those things we know diabetes hypertension blah blah obesity that's all those things are risk factors but male age 50 and woman on pills is also a risk factor for the heart so you can see the number of patients who are available it's all depends on the cardiologist will keep on saying see there are there are people like say gynecologists will never agree that MRGFUS is a good treatment for the uterine fibroid. It's as simple as that. Is this a, that's not something. But academically, yes, the CT coronary angio should be included in the health checkup of the corporates. No question about that. Now I'd like to request Dr. Malani sir to felicitate Dr. Srinivas Desai sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Dr. Malani, sir, and Zado, sir, for moderating this session. Now, I'd like to request Dr. Nishri Kotka, sir, to felicitate Dr. Malani, sir. Now, I'd like to request Dr. Iqbal, sir, to felicitate Dr. Ajay Zado. Sir.